Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Traveling Librarian. I'm Jeff Klapes from the Reference Department at BB Library in Wakefield, and I'm happy to have you join me today on another armchair travel adventure. If you like travel, um, please do follow me on Instagram or check out our YouTube channel with other episodes, and feel free to email me at any time with any of your questions. Um, today, we'll be visiting a rather off the beaten track place, a very small corner of northwestern Romania in Eastern Europe called Maramurish County. So let's get started. Romania has about 19 million people. It's roughly the size of Michigan in the United States. And it's been a full member of the European Union since 2007, although it still does use its own currency rather than the Euro. The language is a Romance language. So it's related to French and Italian and Spanish. And although it's not very widely known out, uh, outside of Romania, if you know any of those other Romance languages, you probably will get um, a little bit of understanding, um, particularly if you read or even listen to people speak. This was a trip that I took a few years ago where we started in Budapest, the capital of Hungary, and then took the train um, east into uh, Romania where we will start today in the city of Cluj-Napoca and um, focus really on this very tiny small corner of um, northwestern Romania called Maramurish County, which is right on the border with Ukraine. Uh, we then went further south into the um, into Transylvania and the Transylvanian Alps and ended up in Bucharest, uh, the capital. But today we'll be focusing just on this small area in the north. Geographically speaking, the main feature of the country is the Carpathian mountain range, which is a very long range of mountains that stretches all the way from the Czech Republic through Slovakia, where the highest peaks are, um, and then curves its way through Romania, um, creating the Transylvanian Plateau in the middle and the Transylvanian Alps along this southern portion here, and then uh, works its way down into Serbia. Um, the Transylvanian Alps are almost as high um, as the highest peaks in Slovakia um, and uh, definitely have the, the same feel that you would get in the, the real Alps in Switzerland and Austria and, and further west in, in Europe. Romania has a lot of animal life um, because of its lack of development, particularly in the mountains, where there are uh, Europe's largest populations of wild bear and wolves and lynx and other large mammals. Um, today, we're going to focus again on this county known as Maramurish, which is in the very extreme northwest corner of Romania. Um, and it has about half a million people. Most of them, however, are concentrated in a couple of very large towns. Um, most of the area is actually quite rural. It's a historic area, so it's on both sides of the Tisa River, which now forms the border uh, with Ukraine. So like a lot of uh, typical border regions, um, the modern country um, ignores the fact that for many centuries people lived on both sides of the river. So now you have um, an area where in on the Ukrainian side there are plenty of Romanian ethnic Romanians and Romanian speakers and conversely um, in the modern side uh, on the south of the river in Romania, you have a number of Ruthenian speakers um, who are ethnic Ukrainians. Most of the people in this area are Romanian Orthodox, um, the vast majority in fact, although there are a few Catholics. Um, we took the train from Hungary across um, beautiful flat um, agricultural land. Here's some pumpkin fields on the way to Cluj-Napoca, which is the largest city in that area. The Maramurish area has gotten kind of a boost in the past uh, couple of decades because, interestingly enough, um, Prince Charles in Britain, who you may know is um, a big fan of cultural and architectural preservation, um, he took an interest in this area and has helped to um, find funding and promote uh, responsible tourism and architectural preservation in the area to help uh, safeguard the rich cultural traditions and architectural traditions in the area. We started our uh, 
trip in this area in uh, the city of Cluj-Napoca. Here's the train station. Um, it's, it's a very large town. In fact, it's the second largest city in all of uh, Romania, but there are constant reminders like this sign that rural life is never very far away. You're um, very likely to see um, all kinds of uh, farm, uh, farm tractors and carts and, and so forth um, as you travel around, even in the city itself. It is in fact, the second largest city in Romania with about 300,000 people. It's a big university town, um, beautiful architecture, lots of young people and, and very vibrant street life. And it's a good base for exploring that Western part of the country. There are nice hotels. Here's our um, pleasant hotel on the uh, quiet side street and lots of good restaurants. Um, here's an example of um, how Romania is an interesting mix of modern, but also very poor and out of date. This is a Dacia. Um, an example of the Romanian National Car Company, which was founded in the 1960s and is now a subsidiary of the French company Renault. Um, you may, in fact, if you know your cars, recognize that this is very similar to an actual Renault because it is. Um, it's the same model just produced in a different country. Many of the Dacias are still on the road. You'll see them all over the place. Um, and the company was named after the ancient Roman province of Dacia, which is in fact uh, what is now modern Romania. But Cluj also has very modern style. You'll see, see um, young people like this wearing um, typical Western European clothes. Everyone has a cell phone. Um, there are um, bars and cafes and all kinds of artistic activities going on and performances. It's a, it's a very vibrant city. The architecture is beautiful. This is the National Theater. Um, and behind it, you can see the Palace of Justice. And here is the Orthodox Cathedral, um, which was built in the 1920s. Much of the architecture um, in the city was built in the late 19th and early 20th century. So you find a lot of uh, elaborate Victorian and um, revival style architecture, and even a lot of Art Nouveau as well. Um, it's a very beautiful city to stroll around, but it's not so big that it feels overwhelming. Uh, here is St. Michael's Church, one of the few uh, old medieval buildings um, in the city. This uh, is a church that dates back to the 12th and 13th centuries. It actually has the second highest church tower in all of Romania, um, 80 meters high. And in front of it, you can see a statue of the Hungarian king, Matthias Corvinus, who is a very important historical figure, um, both in Romania and also in Hungary. He was a leader um, in the 1400s. On the outskirts, you'll often run into some unusual architecture um, like this, um, which leads me to talk briefly about the Roma population in Romania. Roma is the more um, correct current term for what used to be known as gypsies. Um, and they form probably around anywhere from two to four percent of the population in Romania today. Um, and Romania does in fact have the largest population of Roma people in all of Europe, where there are probably somewhere between 600 and 850,000 of them. Um, they are in fact the second largest minority in Romania after Hungarian, ethnic Hungarians. Um, in general, the Roma are very poor. They have high levels of illiteracy and um, very poor education, and perhaps not surprisingly, um, high levels of discrimination also. Um, they tend to be not well connected to the, the culture and institutions of the country. Um, so it's not even clear entirely how many, how many of them there are because they don't get accurately counted in the census. The highest proportions of Roma in the country are in the Northwest, um, this part of the country, and also in the far Southeast in Wallachia, not far from uh, Bucharest, the capital. Um, but the buildings that you see here are kind of unusual because although um, most of the Roma do continue to live their nomadic traveler lifestyles, um, there are a few of them that for various reasons have become wealthy and they build these very unusual mansions uh, 
um, to live in. And um, you will see some of them along the side of the road. They're a very bizarre kind of architecture to see um, at the roadside in Europe. Um, this part of, uh, of Romania also has a substantial uh, population of ethnic Hungarians who comprise about 7% of the total population. Not surprisingly, most of them are on the west side, close to the modern nation of Hungary. The border changed um, at times over the centuries. Um, but there are a good many people here who are still ethnically Hungarian and who speak Hungarian on a daily basis. Um, the other large city in this corner of the country is called Baia Mare, and it is the capital of Maramuris County. Um, it's nowhere near as attractive as Cluj. Here you can see a lot of kind of unattractive um, uh, apartment blocks in a sort of Stalinist style. Um, it also is unfortunately the site of a major environmental disaster from about 20 years ago. Um, there is a large gold mine uh, that has operated near Bayamare for a long time. And they, uh, as a part of production, um, they held toxic waste um, that was released from their processes in, uh, in a lake. And the dam holding that lake back um, burst in 2000, flooding a significant downstream area with toxic chemicals, including um, cyanide, which is still being cleaned up today. Romania has a long history of these kinds of environmental problems as it was trying to industrialize under various um, autocratic regimes through the 20th century. Um, now they are taking environmentalism much more seriously, but um, there's a lot of cleanup to do. Um, hopefully uh, that will benefit them significantly because so much of the country is undeveloped and extremely beautiful, which means that um, if they can keep it clean, um, it means uh, it's a very attractive place for uh, environmental tourists um, to travel, um, people who want to get into the wilderness um, and particularly to see the mountains and the rural lifestyle. Um, we did happen to see when we were in Bayamari this major new Orthodox church being constructed. It's, it's a little unusual to see that because in much of Europe, particularly Western Europe, um, where religion is becoming less and less important. Um, young people tend to be less devout than older generations, um, and many churches go empty. But in Eastern Europe, where Orthodox um, Christianity is much um, more widely practiced, you see um, even young people are still um, fairly observant, and um, there are new churches being built all over the country. Um, this enormous church was being built in Bayamare when we were there. Churches, in fact, are one of the main reasons for visiting Mara Um, We're going to see several of them in this presentation. Um, the entire area of the county is about 80% wooded. And as a result, wood is very important in the life and the culture and the construction of buildings. The traditional churches that they build there many of which are now listed on the UNESCO World Heritage uh, list, are mostly made of local oak. And they were built for the most part between the 17th to the 19th centuries. Um, and they were a response to a prohibition against the building of stone Orthodox churches. Um, because back in that time period, the um, Austro-Hungarian authorities who um, held sway over this area um, and were Catholic, prohibited the local people from building stone churches. Um, so they made use of the materials that they had, which was an ample supply of wood. And so this tradition of building a very unusual, um, distinctive local style of church um, became popular. And many of those churches are, are still there today. There are over a hundred wooden churches, in fact, in the region. They tend to be pretty small, um, they often have a very square nave um, and very large sloping roofs, very tall, thin spires, um, and lots of um, hand-cut shingles. It's a very distinctive look and very beautiful. Um, some of them, in fact, may give you um, a, a bit of a reminder of the kinds of churches that you might see, stave churches in um, Scandinavia, particularly in Norway. Um, and they certainly have a 
uh, similar construction style, but they have also a very distinctive Russian Orthodox look to them as well. This is one in a small town called Desesti, one of many small villages in the area. Um, and it's very typical. Um, it has a double roof here, um, which is kind of unusual. And most of the churches in these villages also have an attached cemetery. We're going to see some traditional headstone designs um, as we look uh, through some of these different cemetery village, uh, village cemeteries. This one has um, the, almost like a halo, like a, a hat that goes over the top of the headstone. Um, sometimes they're made of wood. This one is made of just punched and uh, snipped tin. In the background, you can see a typical haystack. We were there in the fall, which is a good time for seeing uh, harvest activities, and there are haystacks all over the place. Another example of uh, a typical headstone in the cemetery is this one, which instead is carved out of wood with a wooden roof over the top instead of a metal one. Um, because wood is the predominant building material, you see it all over. Um, including in um, not just the buildings, but in gates, fences, um, and all kinds of crafts. Uh, this one has some interesting motifs carved into it. Um, a close-up here um, shows you some of the um, twisted rope design that's very popular, and that is a symbol of long life and continuity. A little further on the main road in that same village um, of Desesti is a brand new church. This is a church that's only about maybe 15 years old, um, but it looks like it could have been there for 200 years and it is built in exactly the same style, um, out of wood with the same construction um, materials and the same construction methods. Here's a view from the top of that church to the haystacks in the valley. Um, Maramorish is a very agricultural area, as I mentioned. Most of the agriculture there is subsistence farming. There's lots of vegetables, livestock, um, and hay um, for feeding the livestock. Um, corn is one of the major crops that's, that's grown as well. Um, one of the things that they make out of the corn is something called mamaliga, which is very similar to polenta. It's a cornmeal. Um, that is the basis for a lot of the cuisine um, in Romania. There's also a lot of beekeeping in this part of Romania as well, so honey production is pretty widespread. Um, here you can see what it looks like, um, a, a close-up of some of the actual wooden construction. Um, you can climb all the way to the top of this new tower um, where you can get a close-up of the very um, detailed uh, hand-cut uh, wooden shingles and a view over the countryside. Much of the countryside in Maramuresh is very um, pleasant and rolling hills. It's not terribly mountainous um, like it is in southern Romania. There are there are hills, but none of them are very big, and um, so it's it's a very pleasant countryside that might remind you a little bit of parts of Great Britain. Here's a more modern. Uh, new house. It does have a wooden gate, but also uh, a big metal one and some interesting decorations on the side of the house as well. And an interesting dormer um, made out of wood. You can see the um, unusual carvings on the eaves. About 30% of the workforce in Maramurish is employed in agriculture, which is a very high percentage. Um, the livestock that they um, have is mostly sheep and goats, which they use for meat, wool, um, dairy products. Um, but they also have pigs and horses and oxen as well, which are used mainly as um, uh, for work. Um, even though this is the 21st century, you will find that um, the farmers of Maramurish still very often use handmade wooden implements instead of modern metal ones. Um, they will very often um, be pulling their carts around with um, animals instead of um, modern tractors. Um, you see a mix of both, but it's, it's surprising the degree to which very traditional methods still prevail. Um, 
um, again, because we were there in the fall, um, we saw a lot of hay harvesting. Here is uh, someone working on a, a haystack. You can see in the center, there's a hole that's used for support. And that goes in the ground and then they gradually build the hay up, um, climbing up onto the top and build it up around this um, framework of poles um, that keeps it steady. You'll find haystacks all over the place in the fall. Um, in fact, I have to admit, I went a little crazy with the haystack photos because um, they're very photogenic and all over the place. You will see a lot of um, this sort of thing in the road that can make um, driving a little hazardous in rural Romania, particularly at night when there's no lights. Um, note again in this picture, there's a good example of people using uh, traditional wooden tools instead of metal ones for their for their farm work. Um, but the because of the lack of traffic, you will very often find people walking in the roads, kids playing in the roads, animals sleeping in the roads. Um, so you do have to be kind of careful uh, as you drive, particularly at night, um, where um, it would be impossible to see somebody if you come around the corner. Um, you could, in fact, zip around a corner and be faced with a very slow moving cart like this. Um, this is kind of unusual because it's actually a modern mechanized tractor rather than um, oxen or horses. Um, you're just as likely to see one as the other. Um, in a nearby town called Greb um, is something a little bit different. Um, the church that you can see in the back of this photo is not made of wood, although it has a very similar style um, with the tall, um, skinny uh, spire and the, the pointy, pointy towers. Um, but this is actually a Catholic church. It's made out of um, stone, stucco instead of wood. And it has, um, instead of a shingle roof, it has metal roof. Um, as I said, most of the Romanians, at least 80% are Romanian Orthodox, but there's a small percentage of the population that is Roman Catholic. And so every now and then you will run across a Catholic church. There's even a Jewish population still in Romania, although very, very small. Um, a hundred years ago, there were about a quarter of a million Jews spread throughout Romania. Um, and at the time they comprised about 3% of the population. Now, however, there are only about 3,500 um, because of the tragedies of the 20th century. And um, that small population is pretty much um, confined to a couple of large towns where there are um, historic synagogues um, that still have ac active congregations. Another example of a cemetery with those interesting um, designs over the headstones and a couple more churches to look at. This one is in a village called Shudeshti and is the church of the, uh, the archangels Michael and Gabriel. Uh, this was built in 1721 and is an excellent example of this just incredible detailed shingle style tower. Um, it's one of the few wooden churches um, that has double eaves. You can see even on the apps on the back of the church, there are actually two layers of roof um, that come down very close to the ground. And a cemetery associated with it. Um, obviously this is Romanian rather than English, uh, but I still feel bad for this poor woman who has been immortalized forever as Fat Elena on her tombstone. Um, not too far away in a little town called Plopish, um, even smaller, is um, this church also dedicated to the archangels Michael, Michael and Gabriel. Um, many of the churchyards have a little gate and a wooden fence, um, as this one does. And in fact, you can see the church of Plopish off in the distance from the previous church that we were just in. The villages are often uh, very close together, only uh, a mile or so apart. It can be hard to find your way around. It would be um, worth it to make sure you have a decent map and a GPS because um, the street signs are not all that great. In fact, 
Um, the only way we managed to find the village of Plobish quite by accident is that we noticed on the back of another sign, someone had handwritten the directions um, of which side street to take. Uh, the church in Plobish was built in 1798. Um, and it, has a lovely little churchyard. It's very small, almost square, um, has a little um, entrance porch um, behind which you can see these beautiful um, carvings and also folk art. Many of the churches have uh, folk art inside as well, painting. Um, if you have the opportunity, um, it's worth asking in the neighborhood for um, if anyone has a key, if the church isn't already open. Um, because the interior decoration is just beautiful. Um, more haystacks. Um, I particularly liked this group of haystacks, which were tiny little uh, thin ones that made me think of uh, a line of creepy marching alien beings walking along the side of the road. Um, here's another example of a, a Catholic church, um, just a small chapel uh, by the side of the road, again, built out of stone and uh, metal roof rather than the traditional wood. And also by the side of the road, a good example of a Roma camp um, where the nomadic Roma people will often settle for a period of time. Um, in this case, um, it looks like they were building either, uh, this is either a church under construction or one of those large Roma mansions. It was hard to tell at this point because um, it was barely being started. And again, you can see the contrast between our rental car and uh, old Dacia, which is still on the road. The, the Roma, as I mentioned, are about, mm, maybe 3% of the population, although it's hard to tell because the census does not count them very accurately. But you will see Roma camps um, in many places in this part of Romania. Here is rush hour with a mix of um, modern 21st century vehicles and farm vehicles towed by horses, um, a very common sight. The haystacks um, that I mentioned are, um, they're extremely photogenic and, and fun to take pictures of because they're almost, you can, you can see where, um, if you're familiar with um, uh, the French painter Monet's series of haystack paintings, you can see where he would have gotten his inspiration. Um, the light, particularly in the late afternoon and the fall is, is just beautiful. Fall is a lovely time to visit this part of Romania because so much agricultural activity is going on. Um, not to mention the fact that the weather is very pleasant, it's warm um, without being hot. Um, and there are fewer tourists in the fall um, and the prices are a little bit lower. Um, not that this is a very traveled part um, of Europe, you're likely to be one of the few tourists um, anyway, um, but it's a particularly nice time to be there. Instead of staying in fancy hotels in the cities, I would highly recommend staying instead um, at a farm stay. And there are many of those uh, pensions and farms that you can stay in in the smaller villages, which will give you an opportunity, first of all, to be closer um, to all of the things that you want to see, um, but also to get um, a little bit of a connection with some of the local families um, and find out about what their daily life is like. Um, we stayed at this nice working farm um, that had a friendly sheepdog um, and delicious home cooked food. Um, it's in a small town called Vadu Ize, um, really tr truly home cooked food. You can see it being uh, prepared here. And as a working farm, there were a number of um, family members and, and hired workers that worked there. They had sheep, um, which are a mainstay in the area. The sheep are used for dairy, but also primarily um, for their wool, which is used to make blankets, clothes, rugs, um, and things like that. And in fact, um, it gets so cold in Romania um, that in the winter, particularly in the, the Alps, 
um, it's bitter, bitter cold um, and heavy, heavy snowfalls. So um, there are traditional products like this <laughs> um, where you are wrapped head to toe in thick sheep wool um, to protect yourself from the winter. I really wanted to buy one of these uh, to bring home, but unfortunately I didn't find one anywhere. I didn't even see people wearing them. This is a, a photograph from the internet. Um, but it's a good example of the kind of traditional craft. Um, we had great food at this, uh, at this farm um, where they served it on a, uh, just a little outdoor pavilion in the backyard. Um, Romanian food, as you might imagine, can be kind of heavy. There's a, it's a very meat and potatoes kind of country. Um, in this picture, you can see a delicious um, hearty soup, but also um, roasted and pickled vegetables like peppers and eggplant and greens. Um, mamaliga, which is the cornmeal um, that is served with herbs and spices. The um, wine that you can see in the back, um, it's actually not wine, these are liqueurs made from plums, distilled from plum, uh, from plums. One is called Twika and one is called Horinza, and they're both pretty powerful fire waters with up to 60% alcohol. Um, they're very good as a digestive or an aperitif before or after a meal. Um, our, our farmhouse um, had some very recent um, wood carving you can see here. Um, that craft is still being done um, today. Um, it's, not, it's not an outdated craft that nobody does anymore. You can still buy brand new um, carved uh, elements for your house if you're building a new one. And um, in the background, you can see something else that's a sort of traditional thing of the area, the tree with pots and pans hanging all over it is an indication that someone in this house is a marriageable daughter. Um, and you can see that going by. Um, more examples of the incredible detail of the front gate to this house with the, the carved um, uh, twisted rope motif, which is very common. There are also fences made out of wood like this. Um, because of the, the huge amount of uh, availability of wood, um, not surprisingly, um, it's used for almost every aspect of life. Um, but again, I really recommend staying in a farm stay like this because it gives you an opportunity to visit with people um, and see what it's like, um, and also to contribute to the economy much more locally. Um, they are doing their best to find a way to make responsible and um, sustainable tourism. Um, and this is a way to help further that. We ate breakfast on this um, interesting little um, hut out in the backyard, delicious home cooked food. And here is the grandfather of the family was also getting his breakfast at the same time. It really is like going back in time. Um, although this is the 21st century, um, it's amazing the degree to which Mara Moorish still um, maintains its uh, traditional culture, its traditional um, methods of farming in particular. Um, they have not expanded into um, modern mechanized farming in the way that many other parts of Europe have done. And so traveling there really does feel like going back in time. This, um, in, in the place that we stayed, um, there was this unusual example of a hayrick. Um, I had never seen this kind before. Um, you can see on, on each corner of the square, uh, rick is a, is a big vertical post. And the roof actually slides up and down on those, um, on those posts. You can raise and lower it depending on how high the hay happens to be. So as it gets used through the winter, um, you can lower the roof and that helps to keep it um, protected from moisture. They had chickens as well. Um, it was a nice place to stay because it was very close to some of the sites to see along the border with Ukraine. Um, one of the most um, 
interesting of which is um, a place called the Mary Cemetery, which is in Sapanta, um, a small town right on the, the river that forms the border with Ukraine. This is an unusual place, um, but it's, it's one of the most visited spots um, in all of Maramoresh. Um, the Mar it's known as the Mary Cemetery because of the whimsical um, naive paintings that depict scenes from a person's life on each of the headstones. Um, and they are made of wood, like so much else in, in Maramorish. Instead of stone, these are carved and painted by a local artist starting way back in 1935. His name was Stan uh, Yuan Patrash. Um, and now the cemetery has more than 800 of these burials with uh, an interesting folk art um, design on it. Uh, this one um, we found kind of interesting. My Romanian is obviously not good enough to um, figure out what the, the, um, the language is on this, the um, stone itself, but you can get an idea from the images of something about the person's life. This was a woman who apparently got um, hit by a car, a child, in fact. Um, some of them are quite old going back to when the cemetery first started. And then there are more recent ones, um, but they all have a very similar style, this very simple um, folk art uh, style to them. The color scheme is for the most part blue. Um, and every one of them has a unique and uh, interesting design where you can try and um, figure out something about the, the life of the person that uh, it represents. It's huge. You could spend hours wandering around looking at all the, the detailed tombs. And there is a, a beautiful church um, there as well. This person seems to have been decapitated. Um, this tomb has... Um, I'm not sure how this connects to the person's death, but it does seem to be um, uh, someone with car trouble. Um, it could possibly indicate that the person was an auto mechanic, um, but again, my Romanian is not good enough to tell you <laughs> what the details were. But it makes a fascinating stop in the area. Um, and if you're there, make sure you visit the tomb of Stan Juan Patras himself. He died in 1977. Um, and um, he passed his uh, craft on to an apprentice who, since his death, has been continuing on his work and um, for all the tombs that were built uh, were added after 1977. Um, there is someone else who was creating the more recent ones in the same style. Not far down the road, again, we're very close to the border with Ukraine, um, is a large uh, monastery complex called Parisapanta. It was built um, not, it, this is not an old monastery. It was only built about uh, 25 years ago um, in 1997. It has uh, a number of different buildings in the complex as you would expect in a monastery. There are, are uh, churches and chapels. There's also um, dormitories and refectories and a library and so forth. The tower is incredibly high. In fact, it's the third highest um, in all of Romania um, and the highest tower made out of wood. It's 78 meters high. That's well over um, 200 feet high. The, the detail of the traditional wooden, wooden shingle roofs um, is just incredible. And it's a superb example of that local style and all the more impressive because this is not something from 200 years ago. It's a very recent um, construction. Um, on, this, on the grounds here is another chapel um, that's uh, octagonal in shape rather than square. But the main church is the highlight. And it's just a, a completely unusual, distinctive style that you won't find anywhere else in the world except this little corner of Romania. The road along uh, the river um, allows you to see across into uh, Ukraine. Uh, here's a good example again of uh, 
um, traditional and modern, our rental car being passed by a um, horse-drawn carriage. Um, but right by this road, you can see those hills off in the distance. That is actually Ukraine. There is a town um, a little further along that you can see um, called Khrushchevo, which is right across the river um, in western Ukraine, roughly across from a town um, called Sigetu Marmetier, which is the largest of the towns in this area. It's about the size of Beverly. Um, there's not a whole lot to see um, in this town. Um, it's mostly industrial. Uh, but it also serves as a very important border crossing because they built a bridge in 2007 connecting it with Ukraine. Um, but the thing that puts it um, on the map historically is that it is the birthplace of a famous writer called Elie Wiesel, who you may know um, as a chronicler of his experiences in the Holocaust. He's best known for his work um, called Night, uh, which is on many uh, school reading lists even today. And um, from humble beginnings in this um, house, um, he is now one of the best known writers of the 20th century. Um, but um, all throughout this area, even in towns as big as um, Sigeti, you will find um, a very rural kind of lifestyle. It's not uncommon to get stuck in traffic behind a slow moving cart like this. Um, a little further to the east, um, there's another town called Barsano, which is um, about 6,000 people, um, one of the larger villages in the area, but um, it has one of uh, eight UNESCO churches um, in the area um, that was built in 1720, but it's even more famous for um, another of these new monasteries that was built in the 1990s. This is one of the buildings. It's actually a convent, not a monastery, because um, it's um, occupied by 14 resident nuns. And the complex is just um, stunning uh, because it's built on a hillside. So there are several churches, um, residential buildings and so forth um, that form a sort of semicircle on this um, beautiful field halfway up the mountain with a view out over the valley. And even though these buildings are not even 30 years old yet, um, they are still built again in this very traditional style, unique to the area, completely made out of wood. In this case, there's a little stucco included. Um, you could swear that you were in Switzerland or Austria um, and all this uh, beautiful carved wood and the long swooping um, uh, shingle style roofs with these interesting eyebrow windows part way up. It's, it's just a fascinating um, design. And particularly late in the afternoon as the sun goes down, um, the, the complex is with all the spires um, up on the side of the mountain is just a beautiful sight to see um, looking out over the valley and all the more impressive when you think that this is not a historic um, monastery from centuries ago. It was built uh, within our lifetimes. You can here um, go into all the churches. Um, here's a good example of an interior of one of the, one of the churches with this beautiful folk art um, painted interior um, showing um, iconography from the Romanian. Orthodox tradition. Um, very close by in an even tinier village, which on, with only about a thousand people in it, um, Pianile Izei is a, a small village that has another one of the um, most important of the historic churches, um, a UNESCO heritage church now. It's in fact, one of the oldest. It was built in 1604, the church of the Holy Paraskevi. Um, uh, it was altered a bit in the 18th and 19th centuries, but it still retains um, much of its original look from uh, when it was first built um, 400 years ago. Um, it's hard to find. The village itself is quite tiny and off the beaten path, 
Um, and even once you get into the village, um, it takes a little bit to find the church because um, it's kind of hidden away in the woods. But it was one of my most favorite experiences in all of my travels in Romania. Um, we did have to call a woman um, who lived in the village who could let us into the church. And despite the fact that she spoke no English and we spoke no Romanian, um, we were able with the waving of hands and the help of a Romanian English phrase book um, to kind of meet in the middle and have a, an interesting conversation. This is obviously not a place that gets very many tourists. Um, so she was pleased to have someone who had an interest in the, the traditional architecture of this very important church. Um, it's tiny. Um, the whole building is probably barely 30 feet long. Um, but the interior is just hauntingly beautiful and very simple. Um, there's no electricity here. Um, you really have the feel of what it would have been like to worship in a church like this when it was built um, 400 years ago. The church is also very well known for um, the incredible folk paintings um, in the narthex, which is a tiny room just as you, as you go into the building before you get into the main room. Um, that depict hell and paradise on opposite sides as you walk into the building. Um, these are a little bit later. Um, they were um, added in 1794, so they're not as old as the original building itself. Also in the same village a little further away, uh, more towards the center of the village, is another of those new churches where you can see um, a similar style. Um, but built out of completely different materials with stucco and um, metal roofing instead of made out of wood. Um, and another beautiful cemetery. The countryside in this area is, as I said, quite rural. There is a, a major road and in, in quite good condition that gets from one end of the country to the other um, in this in this area. Um, but much of what you will probably want to travel to see all these little villages are often um, just rural dirt roads um, that take you through this rolling countryside um, where you will encounter very few other people, certainly almost no other tourists, um, and just the occasional farmer. Um, another good example of a wooden construction, this is a fence outside of a house, um, a typical woven fence from the area where um, they use more pliable woods like willows, uh, which grow in the marshy areas and they are easier to weave into this, um, this kind of fence. Because there's not a lot of rock, um, if you travel in other parts of particularly Southern Europe, um, in the Mediterranean, everything is rock because that's what they have. But in uh, Maramurish, what they have is wood, so that's what they use uh, to construct pretty much everything, including outhouses, um, which if you are in extremis, when you are wandering around in the middle of nowhere looking at churches, um, this is an outhouse at the Church of the Nativity of the Virgin in a small town called Eyud. Um, it was, um, I was very pleased to find it and um, perfectly usable in a pinch, although um, I did have to contend with an awful lot of spiders, but it was worth it because um, Eyud is just a, a gorgeous little um, village with um, another one of the more famous churches in the area, even more so than the church, um, is the incredible cemetery. And you can see here um, another example of these unusual headstones, which are um, made in many cases out of either wood or metal but they have uh, these unusual caps that go along the top of them. Some of them are made out of wood. Um, sometimes there's just a little thin strip of um, metal. And in these cases, it's almost like a little, um, like a hat or a bonnet um, that's made out of um, curved, pressed and decorated tin. Um, it's an absolutely gorgeous um, spot. We were there in the late afternoon and there was nobody for miles around, just this um, very serene um, rural environment with the church. Um, you can just see off into the countryside. 
wildflowers. And again, a, a feel like you have walked into a fairy tale from um, hundreds of years ago. This church was actually built in 1770 um, to replace a church uh, that was destroyed by the invading Tatars um, in, in Romania at the time. And because it was during that period of Austro-Hungarian rule when stone churches were not allowed to be built, um, they rebuilt the church in this uh, wooden style that has since become popular throughout the entire area. Um, I can't recommend enough um, travel to Romania. It's a, it's a very inexpensive place to travel. It's a very friendly place to travel. Um, there are um, plenty of um, very nice uh, boutique hotels and farm stays and um, uh, a mix of cities and countryside and just absolutely stunning uh, rural scenery. So I hope at some point um, you are able to get there. And if you do, please do not miss Mara Moorish because it is um, unlike any other part of Europe that you will ever visit. Um, so that's it for today. I want to thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Traveling Librarian. And as I mentioned before, um, do feel free to contact me um, with any questions by email, follow me on Instagram, um, and also check out other episodes on BB Library's YouTube channel. So keep traveling and I hope to see you next time. Thank you.